You know, it's, it's funny, we're at a place in our life right now that parenting is, um, it, it's not over. You know, our children are grown, we're, we're now grandparents. Uh, and I never thought that I would be, that this day would come, but it did happen, I became a grandmother. And uh, it's uh, been pretty good, it's been pretty awesome. And uh, you know, it's, I'd like to tell you that um, parenting ends, but as long as, as long as I own the name mom, I'm a parent. And um, it never ends, and you can ask my kids that uh, mom always has an opinion good or bad, <laughs> she has an opinion. And it's funny, a few years ago, uh, my nephew, my sister adopted a, a young man when he was about 10 years old. And I don't know, he was about 16. And my sister had kind of been, had to be a little strict on him. And he'd come and hung out with us. And he said to me one day, he goes, boy, I sure wish you were my mom. And I, I don't know if it's Amanda or Zach standing around and they're just like, oh, you really don't want that. <laughs> And I said, because you know what it was, I was the fun aunt for the week. But you know what, my kids knew differently that, you know, that mom didn't put up with a whole lot. And, um, you know, I, I want to say that of all the things I'm proud of in this life, it's, uh, it's my kids. And um, you know what, I'm proud of the fact that they've um, picked up on some good things from me and Alan. And, uh, I, I pray that they go far beyond where we've been able to go, that they pursue and they climb to places that we've dreamed of. But I want to talk to you today. I know maybe you came today thinking that I was going to give you all the, everything you need to know to how to be a godly parent. And um, I wish that I had um, the magic words, but I wanted to share some things with you today. You know, through the stages of parenting, <clears throat> there's a lot of emotion that happens. Um, over the years, Alan and I have felt a lot of happy times, a lot of sad times, a lot of silly times, frustrated, confused, happy again, sad again, mad, frustrated, desperate, angry, bold, proud. A lot of emotions, these are just a few. Here recently, probably a little more melancholy, maybe a little more joyful, but these are just some of the emotions that we've experienced over the 33 years of parenting. And we learned early on that parenting comes at a cost. Sometimes it's sleep, as you learn when they're young and they're babies. I remember when Micah uh, had Allison, she, she called me one day and she said, Mom, am I ever going to get to sleep again? And I said, no. <laughs> No, because once then, once they're babies, uh, there's a little season where it's kind of good, but then they become teenagers, and then God, when they start to drive, it's worse. And then even as adults, even now, ask Zach and Lauren when they're traveling back to Dallas, uh, if I don't get that call saying they've, that they've arrived, I will call them. I don't care what time in the morning it is. So sleep is something we've lost. You know, also sometimes um, it comes at a cost of money, comes at a cost of our personal wants comes at a cost of money and sleep again. <laughs> but you know, years ago I found a book that really, uh, it was probably one of the best books I'd ever found on parenting. And to be honest, Alan and I couldn't have really done, have done it without just the guidance and some of the helps that was in this book. It's probably one of the most practical books you ever read. And uh, I promise you it will cover every issue that your child can create. And uh, I recommend that every parent or want to be parent, read this book. You can find it at most bookstores, even Amazon carries it at a good price, and it's the Bible. You know, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand up on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Then if I was really young, I'd go, Bible. <laughs> no, honestly, there's a lot of books out there but I want to tell you something, this book has a lot of answers in it, has a lot of guidance. And as long as it sits on the shelf, you're never going to know what it says. But I want to tell you something, as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as grandparents, as friends, as mentors, as teachers, there's a lot of information in here that we need. Not just, we don't need because of the children, but we need because of us. And if this is something that really soaks into our spirit and into our mind, then guess what? That's what's going to come out. 
And I really want to encourage you that this is the book. And if you don't have it, look around underneath the seats. There's some free ones or see Jake after church. He'll be sure and get you one. They even come in large print. So, <laughs> no. no, for real, this is really a great book. I, I want to start today by going to Proverbs 22, verse 6. And it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. You know, this is probably one of the most quoted Bibles in, in verses in the Bible when it comes to parenting. Sometimes it's been viewed or talked about as a guarantee that, you know, train up a child and it's, you know, you're guaranteed your child will grow up to love Jesus. But it's not a guarantee. The Hebrew translation for the word train means to dedicate. I, and Alan and I, we did that. Each of our three children, we dedicated them to God. We participated in a church ceremony where we publicly stated that, that we were making a commitment that as parents, we were going to follow God and that we were going to model before them a godly life. You know, making that commitment was not something that I took lightly. You know, it was something that I took very seriously, that I really realized that this was something that not only was it a commitment that I was dedicating this child to what God had called and created this child to be, but I was making a commitment that I was going to do my best to raise that child in the ways of God. And, you know, in reality, this verse says nothing about godly parenting, but it does speak about training. And when you think of that, when he doesn't say parent your child in the ways of the Lord, it says train your child in the ways of God. You know, when I worked as a store manager for Kenneth Cole, one of my goals was to become a, store man, a, a trainer for them. I really enjoyed training. And it came very natural to me because I was someone that, I guess in a sense, if you want to say I follow the rules, I've just always been someone that followed the rules. And as a store manager, I made sure that my store was up to standard, that my staff was trained on the policies and procedures. Uh, I myself was considered to be a brand ambassador. I loved the brand. I, was, I sold the brand. I was committed to the product. Um, and so eventually, I was given the task of being the company, the, the trainer. For, and pretty much for the next seven years, I trained all the new hires that were store managers. And my job, or my goal, was to instruct and teach the guidelines necessary for them to be successful in their new position. And I personally believed that if, if someone was trained correctly, then they had the tools that they needed to be successful in their job. As long as I did my job and I explained to them the policies and procedures and the way the company's expectations, and I made sure that I did it in a clear way and that I modeled it. And when I was training, it wasn't that I was necessarily had the book in my hand and was just showing them. They came to my store and they saw how things were supposed to be. And my staff and I, we modeled the way that the company expected. You know, I mentioned that because at one time or another, we have all been trained in our job. And we can relate the idea of being trained in, in our job because, you know, you start a new job and there's a new way of doing things. Even if it's a job you've done before, there's still a new way of doing things for that particular company. But, you know, when it comes to parenting, we don't think of ourselves as being trainers. We don't think of ourselves as someone that's supposed to be training our children on how that they should live and how that they should, what life they should be pursuing. Over the years, I have watched parents struggle with creating boundaries for their children. You know, when I was training, I was confident in communicating the boundaries because I had studied and I knew the policies and I knew the procedures. And so I was confident when I shared those with people that I was training. As parents or as trainers, I want to call you trainers now, we struggle to define or maintain the boundaries because we do not know the boundaries. And as a company trainer, my job wasn't to create the policies. My job was to train the policies and the whys behind it. 
The problem is many times as parents or trainers, we don't know what it says. We don't know what this book says. So when it comes to setting boundaries, we are constantly changing them. We're constantly removing them. We're just a little wishy-washy. Sometimes we forget that our yeses need to be yes and our noes need to be noes. You know, when we know what, this, when the, what the Word of God says, it's easy to create those boundaries because it creates them for us. So the message I want to really focus on today is not godly parenting, but what I really want to focus on is the godly part and pursuing a godly life. If you want to be a godly parent, then you have to pursue a godly life. So where do we begin? How do we pursue a godly life? We start by committing to form new habits. Today we're going to talk about seven habits of a godly life. And the first habit we're going to talk about is prayer. And if you want to turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It reads, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You know, I'm not talking about a prayer where it's a ritual prayer. I'm talking about a prayer where we are really truly seeking God. You know, I, it's one thing to say a blessing over your food, but it's another thing to get on your knees and really pray. And I want to tell you something. I know we all struggle with this. If I was to ask you, do you are you committed to a life of prayer? Maybe if I ask you to rate it, like on a 1 to 10, what would you say? Well, I'm a, I'm a 5. I'm a 4. I'm a 7. I myself have struggled with this because it's, it requires this type of prayer. Jesus has said Jesus went and was alone and prayed. He wasn't necessarily in a group, but he really, this was a time that he needed to, re, to get his, his spirit reconnected with God. And I want to tell you something. I know we struggle with it because over the month of May, we had prayer every Wednesday night. And I can honestly tell you that we would have 10 to 11 people show up. Now, I'm not telling you that to make you feel bad. I'm saying that because I want you to realize that this is something that we have got to be more committed to. Because when we pray, it is a conversation that we are having with God. It is not just me talking, but it is me listening and God speaking. And when I take time to pray and listen to what God is saying, there is sometimes he is challenging me. And there are sometimes he is speaking to me about things that are, hap are happening in my life or about to happen or happening in my children's lives or happening in the world around me. I want to tell you, I don't know if you've ever been here when I pray, but I walk and pray. I'm a walker. And man, I have put some steps around this building. Because I want, I, I feel like it's something that's like a mission. Like, man, i got to really be on task. But sometimes it's, we struggle with, with this type of prayer because it's hard. It's hard. It's hard because it's really that alone time with God. And you know what happens when you get alone with God? You know, sometimes he might say some things we, that we don't want to hear. But you cannot live a godly life without prayer. I'm going to tell you something every day, 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 your children are going to be faced with trials and temptations. They're going to be faced every turn. They're going to be faced with something. Not only our children, but us. And prayer keeps us connected and sensitive to God's word and to his will. The second thing that we need, to, a habit we need to form is trust. Psalms 103, 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Learning to trust in God's throne and his sovereignty. God is all-knowing, and knowing that God is in control and I can trust him. You know, I want to tell you something. This is something I've personally struggled with, is trust. 
And it's, it's a few years ago, is if you've been around for a while, I'm sure you've heard me talk about it, I had lost my job and went through a season where it was really tough. Man, I, at first I thought I had good control of it, but then it really became like a lot of things happened. Got another job, and then God blessed me with another job. And about six months into the, the dream job, um, this company just goes through like a, a bankruptcy. And I remember I just thought to myself, I gotta get out of here. I really said that I gotta get out of here. I started calling people I didn't even really know and saying, help me, get out of here. And I, I was just desperate because I thought, I'm not going through this again. You know, I mean, I've already lost my job once due to a, a company closing and I can't do this again. And Brian Pilot and I were having a conversation one Sunday. And we were standing right in the back row there. And I was telling him, and I said, you know, I, I gotta get out of here. I gotta find another job. I don't know where. And, and all of a sudden, Brian looked at me and he said, you know what this is? This is, sounds more like it's a trust issue with you and God. Whoo, that's not what I was expecting. I was expecting to say, I'll pray for you. I will pray that you will find another job. What can I do? I was expecting some comfort and sympathy, but I wanna tell you something. Those words went right here, right here. And I remember the next day I was sitting at home and I began to think about that and think, you know what? Maybe I should keep looking for a job. Like everything inside of me said, look for another job. And those words came back to me and said, maybe this is a trust issue between you and God. And I just said, okay, God, you know what? I don't know what's gonna happen here. And I really felt God just speak to me in this, I don't, I, maybe it's not audible, but it sure sounds audible to me. And I just really felt him like put his hand on my head and say, sit down, just sit down. You know what? Just sit down and trust me. You know what? I didn't put you here for, for no reason. Just trust me. My world is bigger than yours. You know what? My hands are bigger than yours. I can handle this. I want to say that was a year and a half ago, and I'm still in my job. We survived a bankruptcy. <laughs> We're still here. And you know what? Regardless of what happens with this job, I know that he is in control. Sorry. He is in control. That really, at the end of it, I don't have any control. Proverbs 3, 5, which I claim is my life first, but it's been a journey in getting it to really believing it. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your pathway straight. We've got to trust in God. We have to stop leaning on our own knowledge. We have to acknowledge him and we have to give him the priority in our life that he's looking for. Trust builds intimacy. In personal relationships, intimacy grows when you are close to that person's thinking and feelings. When you and God talk together, intimacy grows, trust grows. You know, the issue with me was I was talking to everybody but God. And when I started talking to God, he started talking back. Are you a trusting person? Ask yourself today, what am I worried about? Number three is meditation on the word of God. Psalm 63, verses six through eight says, on my bed I remember you. I think and meditate of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings and my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. Meditation means that I read it, I think about it, I search my heart, I ask questions on my mind, and I surrender. It's not focusing on what I see, but it's knowing and seeing what God has said to be true. And let me tell you something, God doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. You have to take time to read the word of God and to allow God to fill your mind with his words. Because I'm going to tell you, as soon as you wake up in the morning, as soon as that alarm goes off, guess what? Everything is starting to fill your mind. You're starting to think about getting the kids dressed or getting yourself ready for work, getting to work, getting your lunch. Oh, did I forget my lunch? Did I do this? Everything starts filling your day. And then you get to work, and then it's just a sea of emails or tasks or things that you have to get done. And then once work is over, when you finally put the, close the day on work, and you get in your car to drive home, then you got traffic, and, you got, and then you get home, and then you got dinner, and you got kids, and you got... 
homework, you got things. So trust me, there's a whole lot of things to fill your mind. But when you don't take time to allow God to fill your mind and to fill your heart and to fill your spirit, it's kind of like you have just, you have created chaos in your life. So you have to take time to meditate on his word. I, this week, Christina texted me and said, we were talking, she sent a verse over to me and asked me if I, you know, if I was familiar with this verse. And we were kind of texting back and forth. And she said, you know, I've really been trying to focus and to really just study the scriptures that have been in the sermons over the week. And I thought, you know, that's really great. It's really great. You know what? It's kind of like going back for seconds. If it was good the first time, it's going to be good the second time. But you know what? You've got to allow God to speak into your life. He speaks to us through his word. You know what? If you're dry and you're empty and you don't know what to do, then go to the word of God. I, t I guarantee you he has something to say. Number four, obey God. Deuteronomy 27.10 says, Obey the Lord your God and follow his commands and decrees that I give you today. And Deuteronomy 28.1 says, If you diligently or consistently... Obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands that I give you today. And when he's talking about these commands, he is referring to the Ten Commandments. And I know you know what those are. Have no other gods before me. Do not create any idols for yourself. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your name or do not covet. He's referring back to these commands. He said, if you carefully follow all his commands, all of the commands that God gives to you, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. When we obey God, we are choosing to walk at a higher level. It doesn't mean that we are better than other people, but it means that we have chosen, we have chosen to follow Jesus and live a higher standard. Jeremiah 27, I'm sorry, 7 and 21 tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. And I want to say this to you, and I want to say it to you in love this morning, but parents, be careful that we're not sacrificing obedience to the word of God in the name of jobs, sports, hobbies, money, and relationships. When we pursue a godly life, we are making a choice. It is a choice to put God first in all that we do. And I want to tell you something. As a parent, as a trainer of my children, the, there were values that we instilled in them. And, and there were things that we taught them when it came to obedience and obeying the word of God and obeying the commands of God. And there were things that were just non-negotiables. That it didn't matter. You know what? There were things that, yes, you could come and maybe possibly present your case. But then there were some things, don't even bother, because you know what the answer is going to be. And one of those things was when our kids got old enough to get jobs, which they all had to have jobs, because we had a rule that if they wanted to get their driver's license, they had to save $1,000. And that $1,000 was the amount of my deductible on our car insurance. So I just wanted to know that if they wrecked the car, they could pay the deductible. No, it was really more of a matter of being responsible, teaching them responsibility, because look, nothing in life is free. Nothing comes free. And so they all got jobs, and you, because for me personally, and I'm sure Alan felt the same way, I knew that other people could train my children to be good employees, <laughs> that they would listen to other people sometimes better than me. And I remember one time, Zach, his first job was at GameStop. And trust me, we had to drive him and pick him up, but there was, he took a lot of pride in that job. And so one night I'm sitting out there. Now Zach, if, for those of you that know our son Zach, he can, have, he can be a little bit stubborn sometimes. And when it came to cleaning, that was not his thing. Now, I'm st sitting in the car watching from afar, and he comes outside with the Windex and the paper towels in the, at the store, and he starts cleaning these windows. And I mean, he is cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, getting all the little corners, and he's stepping back and making sure it looks, he just, and I'm, I'm looking at him thinking, who is that? Because that's not <laughs> my kid up there. I'm like, who taught him to do that? Yes. <laughs> you know? So then I'm like at home, I'm like, here's the Windex and paper towels. I know you know how to use this, <laughs> you know. But no, there was, but there was some non-negotiables. You can have a job. 
but you can't miss church to work. And then sometimes that was tough because most, our kids mostly worked retail jobs, but that was the rule. If you, you can work and you can tell them I can work any of these times, but I can't work during church. And, I, and this was a, uh, the importance of that was that it was the obedience. The obedience to what God said. Look, he said, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. What does that really mean? What does the Sabbath really mean in our life? Are we really truly obeying these things? All right, I'm not going to get stuck there. That's another message. All right. <laughs> Number five, dependence on the Holy Spirit. And this one I thought was so good because we just come out of this series of the Holy Spirit. And depending on the Holy Spirit, it's really surrendering your life to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I want you to stay and I want you to wait and do not leave until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The Greek meaning of being filled is repeatedly being filled. God's children must experience a constant renewal. Every day, every day, God, I need you to fill me with your presence so I can do what you've called me to do today. This is one of those things that is just kind of like food for your soul. You know what? Just because I ate yesterday doesn't mean I'm not going to be hungry today. You know what, just because you filled me yesterday doesn't mean I'm not going to need you today. And I'm going to tell you, as parents, this is kind of what I always kind of call those, the Holy Spirit in us is kind of like those spidey senses. You know, it's those mom, dad senses. And I'm going to tell you something. There have been times in my kid's life that, man, the Holy Spirit would quicken something to me to know that something was not right. Something was not right. And there were times that my kids would be like, how'd you know that? How'd you know? How'd you, who told you? Who told you? I was like, Jesus told me. <laughs> I'm telling you that we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in our life. We need him. And uh, as parents, we've got we've to have that Holy Spirit in us to know, to know. When God quickens that in our heart to know, hey, something's not right. Something's not right. God sent the Holy Spirit to enable us, to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. Number six, giving to God and his people. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, and will be poured into your lap. You know, this is something for me um, when it comes to giving that I've never had a, a struggle with. Because my parents modeled this for me, I mean, my whole life, my whole life. I watched my parents. I watched them give. I watched them give when it was easy. I watched them give when it was hard. I watched them give abundantly. And, and I want to tell you something. My parents taught me that you can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. I watched God's blessing upon their life. And when I became and got my first job, or any time I had money, I mean, there was just something we were taught to do. I knew to give my 10% to God. I knew it because that's what he, was, he asked. But I also understood that there was, I understood the why behind it. It wasn't just this is what I'm telling you to do, that there was a why. And if you read in scripture, God says that if you will give, I, he has this window. And it's a window of blessing that he wants to open up. And the person that controls that window, opening or closing, is you. It's you. You cannot predict what you're going to need in this life. You cannot predict what's going to happen. But I want to tell you what you can predict. You can predict that he is faithful and that he is just. And that that window, when it comes open, the blessings will come. The blessings will come. When we don't give, we're saying not only to, to our, we're not, a, not only are we demonstrating to our children and to the people around us, what we're saying is, I don't need you, God. I got this. Well, I don't know about you, but I do. I need him. I need him. So keep in mind that everything that you need, God has promised to provide. 
We should demonstrate to our children giving to others and being generous. Number seven, forgiving other people. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go, go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And then if you'll drop down to verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. We've all been betrayed. We've all betrayed. We've all been hurt, and we've hurt. We've all been disappointed, and we have disappointed. If we're to truly live a godly life, we have to, we have to pursue forgiving other people. And I, I like the part where it says, don't give the devil a foothold. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of like a, a door closing all of a sudden, that foot just holding it right there. You know what? Let me just keep it open just a little bit. Don't give him a foothold. You know what? We want to pursue the life that God has called us to. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to go ahead and come and, and just prepare. And I'd like to ask you guys, I don't know what song you'd pick, but I want you to do that um, third song. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. Um, I want to say to you today that godly choice Godly living is a choice that we make. It is a work in progress. It's allowing God to show me where I've tripped up, where I've made mistakes. It's connecting with God and knowing that he loves me. As parents, listen to me today. It is our responsibility. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility. I want to say it again, it is our responsibility to train our children to know what matters to God. Not what matters to other people, but what matters to God. It doesn't mean to force them into beliefs or rituals, but rather it means to demonstrate a real, authentic, genuine faith in our Heavenly Father. One that puts the focus on God and loving others. You know, as parents, we have no greater purpose than reflecting God's image for our children to see. You know, my goal was to raise children that loved God. My goal was to raise, our goal, Al and I, our, our goal was to raise children that obeyed God and that wanted to pursue. And I want to tell you something. If, if coming to church was a guarantee then there would be a whole lot of children, more children here, adult children that love God. Because I know that there's a lot of people that love God and have tried. It's not a guarantee. There are no guarantees in this life except that he's faithful. If dedicating our children was a guarantee, we'd all do it. But it's not a guarantee. I want to tell you some of the best that we can do the best that you can do. You want to be a good parent? Then love God. If you want to be a good parent, obey God. If you want to be a good parent, then pursue God. That's the best you can do. That's the best chance you have of raising children that love God. I'm so fortunate that my children love Jesus. But I want to tell you something. There were some times that I can remember standing in my closet crying because I didn't want them to see that, man, it was tough, that I didn't know. There was a few conversations that we had when we had to draw the line and I, we didn't know, we didn't know, that we didn't know that they would make the right choice, but we had to stand firm. You know what, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. If you're going to choose to live outside of this boundary, then you're choosing to remove yourself from the family. 
Boy, that was a tough conversation, but we had it. We had it. We were, we were not going to tolerate rebellion and disobedience. It's tough. Man, it's tough. You can't bargain. You can't bargain with sin. You can't bargain with rebellion. But I want to tell you something, parents. The best we can do is to live it in front of them. I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. You know, I see, I see sometimes on social media, people will put a picture of them and their child and they'll put hashtag mini me. I don't want a mini me because I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I want them to be who God's called them to be. I want them to be everything that God has created them to be. I want them to be the best of who I am and the best of who he is. And I'm gonna tell you something, I'm gonna do my, I've tried to do my best to model that. And there have been days I didn't do so good. But you know what? We've done our best to try to model how do you pick yourself up? You know what? We've made some mistakes. We've done some things that, you know what? Maybe we didn't handle things correctly, but we just did our best in getting up and demonstrating to them what it looks like. You know, this year our theme, Alan mentioned it earlier, is, you know, whatever God asks, do it. And we're six months into this theme. Six months. You know, we've been wearing the t-shirts, we've been drinking out of the cups that say whatever he asks. But I feel like that's all we're doing. We're not truly actively pursuing that. You know, my brother-in-law Todd, this year he told Alan, he said, you know, he said, God really challenged me that whatever he asked me to do, whatever I was asked to do, say yes to. This year alone, he's been to uh, India, he's been to Cuba, he's been to, there was one other country he's gone to. He said, I just, God told me, say yes. And, and what we've seen happen, I watched my brother-in-law about a year and a half ago. He was so depressed. He's a, he's a pastor and his church was really struggling. He was really going through a tough season himself personally. You know, his, his kids had kind of stepped away from their pursuing God, and, and I know he was feeling the burden of that. And, and he said, you know, God just challenged him, said, you know what, just say yes to me. Don't worry about everybody else, just say yes to me. And I want to encourage you today, say yes to God. What is he asking you to do? What does he ask you to do? Say yes to him. You know, when Alan mentioned that he feels like that we're kind of living beneath like our potential. It's like last Sunday, I just really felt like God showed me this beautiful table that he's prepared. And we show up, and instead of taking a seat, we get on the floor, and we start crawling around looking for crumbs. Because, it's, I don't know if it's a matter of not feeling worthy, or not being willing to really assume the person that he's called you to be. But God's not called you to crawl on the floor for crumbs. You're his child. He's already prepared a chair for you, a seat for you. It's a matter of just taking a seat, saying yes. God, what are, whatever you're asking me to do this year, I'm gonna do it. Even when it's hard, even when I'm tired, even when I don't feel like I can do it, you know, even when I don't feel good. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say yes to you. Parents, the best thing I can encourage you today is pursue a godly life. Pursue a godly life. It's the best that we can do to live in a genuine, authentic life before our children that puts God first in everything that you do. First in your finances. First in your activities. First in your job. First in your relationships. If he is not one across the board, then he is not one at all. And, and pursue it. I know it's hard, I know it's tough, but I wanna tell you something, the benefits that will come from pursuing a godly life, there's no way you can even measure the blessing. 
I want you to stand today. And what I want to do is they sing this song. I want you to make a commitment today. I want you to make, maybe it's a new commitment. Maybe it's just a renewed commitment. Maybe it's a first time commitment. But I want you to come. This is not a matter of, of, of someone coming and praying for you. But I want you to come and stand and say, you know what, God, I'm saying yes today. I'm saying yes. I'm saying yes to pursuing a godly life. I'm saying yes to becoming all that you've called me to be. I'm, call, I'm saying yes to doing what you've asked me to do, Lord. God, I just want to be all that you said. Lord, I just thank you, Jesus. So I don't want you to hesitate. I want you to come and come quickly. Come and as they sing, I want you just to surrender to God and give him everything. Lay it all down. Just surrender it all to Him today and say, God, I say yes to you. I say yes.